done. You know, some of you ought to do this for a living. Amen? It's great to have everybody in worship as always. Let us be in an attitude of prayer together. Eternal God, we thank you for the gift of music. It is often a conduit of your grace and power and comfort just when we need it. We thank you for your gift of worship. And Lord, of course, we thank you for your word, which you have called me to proclaim today. And it's something I always need your strength in order to do. Today I need it, Lord, as always. So Lord, speak to me and through me in such a way that all of us do receive a word from you that will make a difference to our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have to confess to you that every Sunday as I preach and look out among the congregation and the choir, I always find it fascinating that here we are gathered, a group of people seeking to follow a person who said some very difficult things, very challenging things, often very offensive things, so much that he was executed for it. One of my all-time favorite stories, which I'm sure I've told before, but I'll tell again, is by Bishop Will Willimon, a retired bishop, United Methodist Church. One Sunday at Duke Chapel, he was preaching a sermon on the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Remember that awful parable? The very end where those who had worked just one hour got paid the same as those who worked all day. You remember that one? Willimon had preached that sermon. Afterwards, he was greeting people in the narthex, and this young lady, this college student, came up to him and said, where do you get your stories in your talks? And when someone refers to a sermon as a talk, it isn't usually very good. He goes, well, I think I get it from South Carolina, where I grew up. And she said, well, that one today really troubled me. I just didn't like that at all. That's just not fair. I mean, if you work all day, you should get paid more than someone who worked just an hour. And Willamont said, wait a second, that's not my story. That's in the Bible. That's in Matthew. She said, Matthew? She said, yes. He said, yes, it's the first gospel of the New Testament. And he looked at her and said, there was an usher tag on her. He said, why are you ushering here? He said, see that tall guy over there? I'm dating him. And he called me up this morning and said he needed ushers today, and so I just came with him. And then Willamont looked at her and said, tell me, what is your religious background? She said, well, growing up, I went to church now and then, but I guess I'm not really anything. And Willamont looked at her and said, you know what? There's a sense in which you're the only one in the congregation today that got the point of the sermon, the point of the parable. Outrageous, messes up your sense of justice, offensive, yeah. Well, just so you know, the man who told it was later murdered for telling it. Outrageous, you got it. Mark Twain once said, it's not what I don't understand about the Bible that troubles me. It's what's perfectly clear that does. And, he, and, and, a, and a, just a serious reading of Scripture will help us understand Twain's sentiments. I mean, the church talks a lot about Jesus in general terms. We'll talk about Jesus in general terms, and, and we like that, but we rarely get down to what Jesus actually said. The church isn't very good at that, and it doesn't take a biblical scholar to figure out why. Because oftentimes, what Jesus said was offensive, was radical, was outrageous. And so it's easier to talk about Jesus in just general terms than it is to the particular things that he had to say. In fact, the very first time Jesus got up to preach to his hometown crowd, you can look it up. This is true. His very first sermon to his hometown people, the people he grew up with, the people who loved this hometown boy, he got up to preach. And you know what happened? After his sermon, they tried to throw him off a cliff. Now, how's that for sermon feedback? You never tried to do that to me before. Now, maybe some of you wanted to. Jesus had a knack for ticking people off. And so today, since it's the first Sunday in Lent and we got to get serious about these things, we're going to take a look at some of the most outrageous, radical things that Jesus ever said. And as we look at these things, we need to ask the question, why did Jesus say these things? And why do they offend us so much? And if they offend us so much, why do they still have such an impact? In fact, 
Some would argue no words are more offensive or outrageous than some of the words that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 in the middle of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And as we pick it up here, Jesus is on fire. Oh, he's on a roll. He is replacing old laws with new ones. And take a look at what Jesus has to say. And I'll warn you, put your seatbelts on, church. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. I don't know about you, but I have some work to do. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And all of that would be tough enough to swallow, but take a look at what Jesus says next. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well? If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And if you love those who love you, Jesus continues, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus said, what? Can you believe we follow a guy who said that? We are here saying, most of us at least, saying we follow a guy that said all that. Now, Jesus, the one who tells us to be kind to people and to treat other people like you would want to be treated, we, we like that, Jesus. We can take that, Jesus. Jesus who says, I am the living water, and if you come to me, you'll never go thirsty. Oh, we love that, Jesus. I love that, Jesus. And that Jesus who says, well, I'm going to give you eternal life. Oh, we love that Jesus. But this Jesus who says, forgive your enemy. Take it on the chin. Don't fight back. We'll have none of that. Thank you very much. A colleague of mine remembers when he invited the great preacher and speaker Tony Campolo to his church to be in his pulpit. Some of you may know that name. Tony Campolo is kind of a renegade Baptist preacher. He's very different, very powerful. He's written a lot of books, has preached all over the country. He's up in years now, so he doesn't speak as much. But one time my colleague invited him. This was many years ago, and he was all excited. The church got all excited. They planned for months in advance. They got flyers ready. They told the church on this particular Sunday, the great Tony Campolo was coming to preach. The Sunday came. Campolo got up in that church's pulpit and preached, and for most of the sermon, he had the congregation in the palm of his hand until... He said the most outrageous thing. You're not going to believe he said this. He asked that congregation that day, have you prayed for Osama bin Laden? Oh, again, this was a while ago. Campolo said, you know, Jesus says to forgive our enemies, and bin Laden is certainly one of our enemies. Have you prayed for him? Have we prayed for him? Well, you won't be shocked to find out that He was never invited back to that church. In fact, my colleague said he received angry letters and emails for weeks. But it shouldn't surprise us. Jesus was killed for what he said. I recall calling up a a friend of mine. I wanted to complain about someone I didn't like very much. Now, I know you're shocked by that. But I want to uh, remind you, I am human, and I am moving on to perfection, but I'm not there yet. 
But I just couldn't stand this person. They had, they had driven me up the wall. And I just wanted to call my friend and complain and say bad things. So I called him up, and I did. I just went on and on and on. You, could have, you should have heard me moan and complain. On and on and on. And then my friend, you know what? He had the audacity to say back to me, well, Charlie, have you prayed for him? God, I can't believe he said that. (laughs) I mean, I don't know what upset me more, the fact that he asked the question or the fact that I had really forgotten to pray for him. Sometimes it's hard to follow Jesus, isn't it? I mean, why, why, why did Jesus have to say the things that he said? Ever thought that? Ever felt that? Especially today? Can't we redact some of this and only keep some words that he says in Scripture? I mean, why, why did Jesus say this? Why can't we just get together with like-minded people who think the same things and believe the same things and have a little disdain for those who are different from us? Why can't we get some revenge every once in a while? I mean, it'll feel so good. Why can't we just have a little room here? And the answer to that question gets to the heart of Christianity and why it has stood the test of time. And sometimes that message and answer comes to the mouth of a child. Recently, it came through something my son Paul said. Now, I'm going to sound like an old man when I say this, but, you know, Paul, he's, he's, a, he's five, and he's really into video games now, you know. Brandy and I have done our best to keep all those videos and those gaming systems at bay, but you know what? We're not perfect, so he loves those games. And, and he watches these videos. Have you seen these videos? Paul watches people play video games. <laughs> have you seen this? He doesn't play them, he watches people play video games. And I'm told they make all kinds of money. Man, I'm in the wrong business. I think I'll start a channel where I I will have people watch me brush my teeth and shave and I can make commentary on it. Maybe a little side hustle? What do you think? Well. Anyway, there's a game that we like to play together. It really is a good one. It's made for the the, the mobile phone, and I have to admit, I have to confess, I'm addicted to this game. It is the mobile version of Battleship. Remember that game? Well, the mobile version is unbelievable. It's a whole new game. You got torpedoes. You got sonar. You got strategy. You got weapons. Oh, it is amazing. And Paul and I were on the couch playing the game together. We like to share and help one another. And there was this guy. You can play with people online, of course. And we kept playing him, and we kept beating him. Oh, it was so good. He just, he just wanted to keep playing us because he wanted to win. And we kept beating him. It was so sweet. Well, we're in the middle of this game, the seventh or eighth one, and we're winning. And you know what my son Paul actually did? I was so mad. He took the phone from me and said, Dad, we're going to let him win for once. I said, what? Give me that phone. I was so upset. Give me that phone. No, no. No, Dad. No, Dad. And then he hit me. And then said, well, Daddy, don't you talk about in church how you need to be kind to people? And I so wanted to say to him at that moment, not in battleship. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for that sermon, buddy. (laughs) You know, (laughs) you know why I think the words of Jesus are so tough and challenging? Because Jesus is constantly obliterating our lines of who gets loved and who doesn't get loved. 
That's what, that's what really offends us about Jesus when you really get down to it, because we like to draw lines of distinction. Well, his love goes here, but it doesn't go beyond that, and Jesus is constantly obliterating those lines, and it upsets us. It also upsets us because Jesus comes and he turns our values upside down and says, you think it's so good and noble what your values are? They're not even close to the kingdom of God. I mean, we believe in the American dream, don't we? We love that. Oh yeah, the world is your oyster. American dream, you can be whatever you want, do whatever you want, eat and drink and be merry, obtain all you can. And then Jesus, rather inconveniently, says to us through the parable of the rich fool, you fool, your life is being required of you right now. And all these things you've accumulated, whose will they be? Don't you realize you are rich to bless other people? We believe in being fair. They get what they deserve, right? We teach our children, we teach everyone, you get what you deserve. If you work hard, you'll get, you'll get rewarded for it. If you don't work hard, well, you get what you deserve. And then Jesus has the audacity to say to us through the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, I choose to give to those who only worked one hour the same as those who worked all day. We believe we're gonna be rewarded for being faithful. Coming to church, preaching the gospel, going to Bible study, serving people consistently, we're gonna be rewarded. And then Jesus actually gets on the cross and turns to another man on the cross who'd been a criminal his entire life and never was faithful a day in his life and said to the man, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now that's not fair. Going to man on death row, he's murdered all these people, and he confesses Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior at the last minute, and he gets the same reward as the rest of us? We believe in getting even, getting some revenge. You hurt me, I'm gonna hurt you just the same. And yet Jesus comes along and has the audacity to say to us, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Turn the other cheek. We believe in being successful. Getting whatever we want, being as happy as we want, being in control of our lives, and yet Jesus comes along and he says, unless, unless you take up a cross and follow me, you can never enter the kingdom of God. Unless you can live a, live a life for other people rather than yourself, you'll never know what real life is. I mean, that homeless guy on the street, he could take care of himself, couldn't he? He could get a job. And that juvenile that's in and out of juvenile detention centers, it doesn't matter that his mommy and daddy beat him, does it? I mean, you can't be responsible for irresponsible people. And yet Jesus has the audacity to say to us, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. No wonder Jesus was murdered, huh? Outrageous, because Jesus gave us a high definition picture of what it looks like for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes that picture is so bright Sometimes that picture goes against everything we hold dear that we have to look away. Oh, we have caveats. Well, he was just exaggerating. Well, he was just telling a story. Well, let me look at my commentary. Surely he didn't mean that. We can dress it up all we want. The truth is, Jesus turned our world upside down because he turned our values upside down. 
Want to know why Jesus, when he preached his first sermon to his hometown crowd, why they wanted to kill him? I mean, I could give you a complicated theological answer that might impress you. But here's the bottom line. They wanted to kill him. Because when he got up to preach, he basically told his people, his hometown crowd, that God's love was not only for them, but for everyone. And they wanted to kill him. Here's, Here's the thrust of today's message. The thing that offends us the most about Jesus usually is the only thing that's gonna heal this world. And that is, God's love is limitless. It knows no bounds. It always forgives, always is merciful, always loves. And he calls us, the church, to embody that. We have to be reminded of that because I tell you what, we have to be reminded as a church, especially today, that the early church, you know, you want to know why it grew? It didn't grow because of coercion. It didn't grow because it was popular with the culture. It didn't grow certainly because it was involved in politics, God forbid. It didn't grow because Paul was in skinny jeans preaching. Aren't you glad I'm not wearing those? It grew through fascination. Because these people were looking at these Christians and saying they are forgiving people when no one else is forgiving. They are loving people when no one else is loving. They're being merciful when everyone else is hating. Who are these people? And what is this love? The church needs to get back to that. I get so sick and tired. And in a minute I'm going to end this sermon, so just hold on. I get so sick and tired of the way the church is presented and the behavior of the church. Always, we're always telling people what we're against and why we're divided. You think anybody in their right mind wants to be a Christian? When they see they, the way we behave as a church in general? No. We need to get back to what unites us and what we are for. The love of God, and if you're in someone in worship today and maybe you're not familiar with Christianity or the church, this is one of your first messages here or first times here, let me tell you, the bottom line is God loves you more than you can ever imagine. And I believe this church believes that and will show that to you. Chuck Colson, maybe some of you know that name from many years ago, he was one time counsel to the White House, a very strong Christian, and he started Prison Fellowship, which went into prisons and held worship services for the prisoners. One time he told about the time that he went into Indiana State Penitentiary and held a worship service for those on death row. After it was over, they were leaving the prison and going through their necessary protocols to leave a prison, but they were missing one person and Colson was frantic. And so he, he went back to the cell block and he found the man. He was in a prison cell with another prisoner with his arm around the prisoner. And Colson was irate and said, what are you doing? We can get in trouble for this. What are you doing? And the man said, forgive me, but this is James Brewer. He's been sentenced to die. And I'm Judge Clement and I'm the one who pronounced his sentence, and we just needed some time to forgive each other. Jesus is relentlessly in love with the world. And and where would we be without such love? And would you believe there is room in his arms for everyone? So I have this budding notion 
that when the church finally gets this, the kingdom will come. Let's pray. Oh, dear Jesus. Oh, it's an ambitious call you have upon us. Oh, we love your grace and forgiveness and we embrace it. But then you call us to a life of discipleship, of reflecting your limitless love. And Lord, there are days when it's hard. But Lord, help us. We know we can't do it without your spirit and power, and so we yield to it. We ask for that power because we know it's the only thing that's going to transform this world and heal it. It's in Christ's name we pray.